Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have ongoing conversations about living in the future. This is a special CES edition of Fast Forward, and my very special guest today is Raj Kapoor. He is the Chief Strategy Officer for Lyft. Now, you know Lyft is a ride-hailing uh, platform, a ride-hailing service, but they're also making investments in self-driving cars, in scooters, and a whole lot more. Raj, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Happy to be here. So last year at CES, I got my first self self-driving car experience on the open road, um, and it was in one of your vehicles. It's been 12 months later, we just got out of the car, I did it 12 months after the fact. Um, how much has changed in 12 months? Well, um, hopefully it was as boring as the first time. It was <laughs> as boring. <laughs> Good. Uh, what's changed is, first of all, the system's gotten smarter. And the smartness comes out in, in terms of planning and prediction, and you can tell probably how smooth the ride was. So if it's seeing pedestrians or lots of cars, it doesn't make knee-jerk reactions. It has measured reactions and acts like a really good driver versus maybe an inexperienced driver. So that's a big change. Two is that we broaden the area that we're operating significantly now. So we're operating a geofence that covers almost all the major hotels in Las Vegas, and you can go anywhere in that area versus very specific points. So last year, it was a, it was a demo during CES. Um, journalists were invited into the car. It was a relatively controlled experience. But then you opened up that similar experience to average consumers or Lyft consumers in Las Vegas. Um, why did you do that, and, and how is it going? Yeah, it's one of those uh, rarenesses where a cool demo from CES right away becomes a live service. And we have now 30,000 rides uh, that we've had on the system. And so far, the feedback has been awesome. Consumers have rated it a 4.95 out of five stars. Nine out of 10 people that go on a ride would come back and do it again. So we're really quite pleased with it. And I think people have a lot of questions around self-driving. There's some fear. But once they get in and do the ride, they are really excited about it and ready to do it again. And so those ratings are really just the same ratings that Lyft drivers are getting at the same time, so it's on the same scale. It's using the same scale, and in their mind, it's that same perception of how comfortable, clean, did, it, did, the, did the person or the robot drive well, all those things go into, their, into account. What gets a better average score, the, the human Lyft driver or the automated Lyft? Well, I would say that the, the automated Lyft is pretty high, but the human drivers definitely get up there too mm -hmm. uh, in doing it, but 4.95 out of five is very respectable. So when it comes to, um, is there anything about that, because I think that's one of the things that makes Lyft different, is that a lot of other companies are having pilot programs, but they've got test drivers. They're trying to simulate the real world experience. You're providing a service for actual consumers. How does that help you collect more meaningful data or build a better service? Yeah, so we can notice a lot of things about this. First of all, Las Vegas is a great proving ground because there's so many people from around the world that come here. And so it's, you're not just having residents that are here, you're having people that are using it for their vacation, using it for going back and forth. And so we're able to collect lots of data from a big diverse group of people. Um, and we're able to see what the repeat use is like, uh, what, do they like what do they like about it, what do they dislike about it, um, how much do they like to walk uh, to the vehicle versus not. There's all these little nuances that go in. Another example is uh, around remote assistance. Um, we noticed that the, the people love to have a conversation with the safety driver. They're so excited at that moment. And so the question we have is as we move in the future towards a safe, without a safety driver, how do we still get that uh, interaction with the consumer? So can we have a remote assistance to do that? So we're learning all these little things by being in the real life out there with people. And it's, I imagine it's comforting because people have questions about what's happening in the car. And right now the safety driver can answer those questions. Yeah. Take the safety driver out you still want to be able to answer those questions for the first couple of years that people are getting used to the, te the technology and setting expectations. Yeah, and in fact, there's two people in the front. There's a safety driver and also uh, a safety engineer that's in the front. So usually it's the safety engineer that's answering the questions. Safety driver is very focused on the road that's doing it, but the problem nonetheless will exist in the future without that. And so what we have to do is, and we're right now developing remote assistance systems where you can talk to a lift operator and ask the questions that you need to ask to, and have a very conversational interface with the consumer. Because there's a lot going on there, there's a lot going through their head around building trust. What is this car seeing? Is it acting the way that I would act? And then asking questions about how does that technology work? How can it do this? So I have to ask the question, when you talk about self-driving cars, the question is what's gonna to happen to all the human drivers who make their living driving people from point A to point B? 
you've said in the past that we're still we're always going to need human drivers. Um, I think that we may not need quite as many of them. But like, how do you think we should respond to these technological transformations? Because it's clear that we're not going to go backwards. But how do we go forwards in an intelligent way? So I think going to the question around drivers. Um, we still believe that there will be a need for more human drivers than there are even today. And if you look at it, uh, these ride-sharing services in the U.S. make up about 0.5% of vehicle miles traveled. Even if we go to 5%, that's there. And the majority of rides become self-driving. If you do the math on that growth of overall number of rides, you need even more, dri more drivers than you have today. Two is that um, this technology is great, but it's going to be slowly rolled out. It's going to take a while for it to be able to do all conditions, all places, all the time. And so you need that there because the consumer, just like between a 3G and a 4G network, wants to have a ride or just wants to make a call or get a message. So we need to have that seamless there. So I don't think we're going to see a reduction. That being said, um, you know, the other question you had just in general is how do, how do uh, we respond to this? We haven't even begun to imagine around the new economy that comes out of this, around there's so much infrastructure that needs to be built around parking and charging and even mundane things like cleaning cars, uh, which right now the driver's doing it all the time, but if there's no driver, how are you going to get all that done? And then there are, there are groups of people that need to have assistance, whether it's elderly people, people requiring physical assistance, young children. So we think there's going to be opportunities abound, and we've always in the past underestimated what the new opportunities are and overestimated the loss that's going to be there. So what do you think the biggest obstacle to the widespread adoption of driverless cars will be? Is it regulations? Is it the technical limitations of being able to solve these problems? Um, is it the safety issues? Like, what, what do you think the obstacles are? Yeah, the obstacles, I would say, uh, there's a number of them. First of all, it is consumer trust around um, can I trust that this vehicle is going to operate safely, not just for me, but for all the environment and community around it? It's really important. Um, two is the technology itself, as I mentioned. I think we're on a good path and we're improving, but it's going to take some time uh, to get there. The other piece of it is that the cost of the vehicles are significantly expensive right now. They're using expensive computers, expensive sensors. Um, they're not made necessarily to last for a long time because they're in a lot of R&D stage, so the reliability and the cost are, have to get better and will, just like the computer industry has um, in doing it. And then, then there's on the government side the regulations that uh, need to allow for this to flourish. Uh, we're seeing good progress there. If we continue to have um, a federal level uh, under, uh, uh, safety standards, then that's something that's really positive and it's not going to be that you have to create a specific car for a specific jurisdiction. So we think those are the barriers, but they all seem uh, very doable. So one of the other things that have, that's happened in the last 12 months is that scooters went from a small uh, you know, gadget for enthusiasts to a mainstream transportation platform that is uh, taking over a lot of cities, frankly. Um, so you know, what is it about, uh, and Lyft has made some investments in that space too, you know, where do you see the opportunity in scooters and what makes Lyft's approach unique? Yeah, we classify all this as micro-mobility, scooters and bikes. And what we found is that there's a really unmet need for that, call it zero to two mile range, uh, short distance trip. Yes, you could take a lift um, or you could potentially walk, but you're in that zone, especially if it's a half a mile or more, where it's, it's a little bit long to do that. And uh, it is a really convenient thing to do. It's also a really fun thing to do, whether you're biking or scooting, um, and especially if it's electric propulsion, so you're going a little faster than you would by yourself. Um, it's exciting and, and fun to do that. So uh, I'm also surprised on how quickly that has penetrated, but I think we're living in a world now where there's mass adoption, there's social networks, um, and the innovation that's coming, that came in software so fast, we're seeing in hardware. You know, new versions of scooters are like every month and they're coming out. That's one of the amazing things is that it must mean that the, the cost per scooter to manufacture a scooter is so low that the co companies don't mind losing Yes, there's some day. loss rate and breakage rate that is acceptable given the high usage. Yeah. And it works for the consumer because it's still a very reasonable price uh, to get around town. So what we're seeing is it's really going to be a, a stitching together of a number of different modalities, whether it's bikes, scooters, walking, uh, ride sharing together to provide a really good alternative to owning a car, which is expensive, a hassle, has parking, congestion, emissions. 
it's a really big problem that all these things together are going to be solving. And you want to be able to, people to use, open up the Lyft app and get to where they want to go, whether it's by a car or whether it's a scooter or a bike. It almost doesn't matter to you. It depends on what the user needs at the moment. We want to get them from point A to point B in the most convenient way that they could get there and without owning a car. That's the key, the key criteria. Do you think that people will still own cars for, those, for long distance trips or for other purposes? Or do you think that there's going to be a slice of the population that just says, you know what, I live in a city, I very rarely have to go more than 10 miles, and when I do, I'll rent one? Yeah, I think uh, there will clearly be uh, a, big a big group of the population, especially that lives in cities, that really will not be able to justify owning a car. All the use cases that you're thinking about, you could, you could utilize by short-term rentals, car sharing, um, or ride sharing, or micromobility, or also public transit. We've integrated in public transit, and, it, and it's the best way to get around in a lot of instances, and um, we're feeding into that. So I, I think that there will be a, a big chunk that does that. There's a lot of inertia still about buying a car, and some people are still wrapping up a car in, in their self-worth and their identity, but that's changing, especially with young people. So I want to ask you the three questions uh, I ask everybody that comes on the show. Um, is there a technology trend that, that keeps you up at night and that you're really worried about? You know, um, I've seen the online advertising industry has become this incredible performance machine um, that clicks drive revenue. And what's drive clicks is an emotional response. And that can lend itself uh, to, I think, content that could be really damaging to society. And we're seeing that play out, not just in the political realm, but the way that you get a response which, gener which drives the business model is to raise the emotional anxiety of a person in, in either good or bad ways. And I don't think that feels like a great model that we should be building media upon. And what's the solution to that? Because it, it's, I find myself doing it, even though I know all of the mechanics, I know why I shouldn't be doing this, it usually happens at the bottom of an article page and there's six stories that are all provocative yeah. and tuned just to my personality. And tuned just to your personality. And I think, so part of it is, first of all, just people understanding that what's driving it so that you can have a more uh, rational view of making that decision uh, versus I think most people don't understand it. Um, that's there and what the incentives are in the system. And two is, is really the consumer having to take it in their own hands and saying, look, I'm willing to pay for an experience that doesn't have that because I want to really have focus and I don't want to be distracted in ways that I think I don't want to be in the future. Is there a technology, a device, or a, a service that you use every day that inspires wonder? You know, um, I would say, uh, you know, I am a owner of an electric car and have a Tesla, and that really inspires wonder for me. And not just that it is electric and all the benefits of that, but just what they've done with software and the ability to update the car is just phenomenal. All that benefit that I've seen my phone and my PC has now come to the car. Yeah, I think um, there are a lot of Tesla owners. Obviously, it's a fantastic product. It gets you what it works the way it's supposed to work. But there's an aspirational aspect to it of pushing boundaries and transforming what cars mean yeah. that I think a lot of a lot of people want to buy buy into and they want to be a part of. Yeah, it, it's it's that brand association that Elon has done a really good job around. Raj, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you. That's Fast Forward for today. If you want to see past episodes of Fast Forward, you can see them on PCMag.com, on Apple Podcasts, or anywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you in the future.